Welcome to this first uh, conference of our speaker series. So I'm uh, really happy that you, you are here. I'm really happy that we are organizing this series. Um, so as you saw perhaps in the advertisements and, and the title, this is a, a series in AI ethics, uh, which is very uh, fascinating and also challenging uh, field uh, of research. A lot is going on uh, around these issues and these topics uh, these, uh, these days. And so the idea behind the series, I think, was to, to so there's already plenty of uh, uh, many things going on in Montreal. It's a very lively community. Uh, many events are organized. Uh, but the idea behind the series was really to, to invite a few people that were not uh, from town and get them here in Montreal and uh, give them enough talk, in fact, to, to, to really uh, uh, talk about their research. Um, and this is, yeah, this was, uh, this was our uh, intention. And so we're really happy to have uh, Avi Goldfarb here uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, let me start first perhaps by um, uh, uh, saying thanks to our uh, partners for the series. So Ernst and Young, um, who else do I have on my list? So Mila, the former uh, Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithm, which is now I think the AI, um, AI Quebec Institute. Uh, Ivado, uh, the Institute for Data Valorization. The, I'll say it in French, Chair de Recherche du Canada en Analyse Respectueuse de la Vie Privée et Éthique des Données Massives. The Center for Research and Ethics, the School of Management Sciences here at uh, UCAM, and, uh, the, and Humania also uh, at UCAM. But uh, perhaps most importantly, let me say a thanks to the people behind or beyond these institutions. So uh, Martin Gibert first, uh, with whom I have co-organized this, uh, this series. Then uh, Anne-Marie Hubert from uh, Ernst Young, Myriam uh, Côté from uh, Mila, uh, Sébastien Gams from, uh, from um, who is the, the chairholder of the, the Chair de Recherche du Canada on Analyse Respectueuse de la Vie Privée, etc., etc. I won't repeat it a second time. And last but not least, Aude Marie Marcou is behind and will be at the, at the camera. Um, to his, uh, who is uh, coordinating, helping us coordin uh, coordinate the, the series. Uh, and we're trying to uh, make a cap, so take a video of the, the session today, so we may be able to post it online. I'm not making any promise, so if you like my kids, as soon as I promise something on a screen, they all go crazy and they're really disappointed if we, if we cannot deliver. Uh, so I'm not making any promise, but uh, normally if everything uh, goes the right way, we'll be, uh, we'll be able to record the, the, the conference today. Okay, so, um, so Avi uh, Goldfard will hear, uh, is here tonight, he will present uh, a talk uh, whose title is The Simple Economics of Artificial uh, Intelligence. So he is the Rutman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare, but also Professor of Marketing at Rutman School of Management at the University of Toronto. He's also the Chief Data Scientist and the at the Creative Distribution Lab. He's a Senior Editor uh, at uh, Marketing Science. Uh, he's also a Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, his research uh, focus are the opportunities and challenges of the digital economy. And he is the author of um, uh, this book here, so um, the uh, Prediction Machines, the Simple Economics of Artificial uh, Intelligence uh, that was published in 2008 at Harvard uh, Business Review Press. So that's two years ago, more or less, which is, which is almost like a century, in fact, when it comes to uh, the et AI ethics or research in artificial intelligence. Uh, and by that, I do not mean that your book is outdated. I think it's still very accurate. Um, but uh, the field is evolving so rapidly that uh, many new contributions um, are, are being published uh, very uh, frequently. So yes, so he will be talking perhaps for 45, uh, 50, 55 minutes. Then we'll have uh, a comment by uh, Peter Deitch that I will present uh, after uh, Avi's uh, talk for perhaps five or 10 minutes, and that should leave us at least 30, 40 minutes for, uh, for questions, so there's a microphone there, so you'll be invited to, to come to the microphone and ask a question, if you will. So, without further ado, please uh, say welcome to, uh, to Avi Goldfarb. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm an economist, um, so when I got the, the invitation to give a talk on AI ethics, I thought at first, um, I never really thought deeply enough about AI ethics, and certainly less deeply than many of the people here, 
Uh, but what I, I do have an understanding of is a way to uh, understand the current generation of AI and then think about the economic implications and my hope and, and expectations once I talk through the economic expectation, uh, implications for organizations and then for society at large, uh, you will then come up with some questions and some thoughts on how to think through the, the ethical issues. So, uh, so I sit at the University of Toronto, not so far from here, and um, at the University of Toronto, as, as many of you likely know, um, a lot of the advances behind the current excitement in AI um, were discovered, let's say. So Jeff Hinton in particular, his lab is in our computer science department. His computer science, the computer science department uh, sits about two blocks from where we sit in the business school. And through that computer science department over the last uh, couple of decades came, you know, largely working with him, the future heads of AI at Facebook, at Apple, at OpenAI, and at a large number of other organizations. To the point where Hinton, along with, with uh, Montreal-based Bengio and Yann LeCun, uh, won the Turing Award this year um, for sort of, you know, major contributions to computer science. Now, uh, many of you already work in universities and you probably know how universities work, so the standard process would be we would open the school newspaper and say, oh wow, look at that. Some computer scientists at the University of Toronto did great things, that makes us feel good, and we'd move on. And that would be largely the extent of the interaction between the departments. What's different about my co-authors and I is we run this organization called the Creative Destruction Lab. And what the Creative Destruction Lab is, it's a program for helping science-based startups to scale. And so, um, and we have one in Montreal too now, actually. You're involved? Or not yet? Okay. Um, so we started the, the lab in 2012, and in 2012 we had this company called Atomwise that said it was an AI company. It was run by a PhD student out of, a former PhD student out of Hinton's lab, and they were trying to predict which molecules bind with which proteins. And then the next year in 2013 we had two more AI companies come through the lab, also out of our computer science department, one based on doing AI, one also for drug discovery and the other in the insurance industry. Then the next year we had several more in all sorts of different industries, seemingly using the same technology and applying it to um, all sorts, you know, a wide variety of industrial applications. And at this point we decided that this was worth investigating, this is worth investing in, this is worth trying to get our heads around. And so what this talk is, and what the book is about, this book, um, is a sense of what we've learned from now advising a few hundred AI startups, combined with our prior to the Creative Destruction Lab careers on understanding the economic implications of technology. And so that gets us here, and that gets us here, right? So when we're thinking about AI, we have, uh, oh, there's, an AI ethics room is, is even full, right? We, we have, not, not to criticize, AI economics is even, you know, uh, is also surprisingly full. Um, we have this sense that AI is expected to surge. There's a lot of excitement when you read the press about AI. And at the same time, underlying this excitement is quite a bit of anxiety, right? So we've, we've accepted now that machines are stronger than us, but if the machine is smarter than us, then what's, what's left for us? what's left for us humans to really do. Underlying both the hype and the anxiety is a lot of confusion about what we're really talking about. And if you read the press, the optimistic scenario is a robot like C-3PO. What is C-3PO? C-3PO is an artificial intelligence that can do just about everything humans do. C-3PO is the optimistic vision because C-3PO does two things better than human. First, in the movie, what's the, what is his role? He's a translator, okay? The other thing that C-3PO does better than human is C-3PO listens to humans. And the rest of science fiction is filled with robots that are better than human in some dimension, but they don't listen to humans. And that's what gets us the Terminator, and that's what gets us Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey, and whatever uh, you know, pessimistic, AI future that you, you know, 
you favor or disfavor um, is based on this idea of truly intelligent machines that don't listen to humans. I think it's very important for people to think about the consequences of machines that are better than human, that are smarter than human. But I think it's very important to recognize that that's not the technology we're talking about today. When we, the reason we're talking about AI in 2019, and we weren't really talking about it in 2009 or 1999, has very little to do with an artificial general intelligence, or at least very little to do with us being closer to artificial and general intelligence than we were 10, 20 years ago. It has to do with advances in a particular field of AI called machine learning. And uh, the initial jump in the quality of the technology was from a subfield of machine learning called deep learning. And we should think about machine learning as prediction technology. What's changed is we've gotten much better at prediction. Okay. Truly artificial general intelligence has been 20 to 50 years away since the very first AI conference at Dartmouth College in 1956. And it continues to be 20 to 50 years away. That's not never. But when we think about the short-term consequences, the reason we need to think about this now, we should be thinking about prediction technology. And what is prediction? Prediction is the process of filling in missing information. So what does better, faster, cheaper prediction mean? How do we understand the consequences of that for society and for the economy and for organizations? To get your head around that, let's jump back at technology. Um, I'm guessing about a quarter of you remember 1995. Maybe? You remember it? Okay, excellent. Maybe more. Um, 1995, for those who don't remember, was a very exciting year in technology. 1995 was the year uh, that the last aspects of the public internet, the NSFnet, were privatized. It was the year that Bill Gates wrote his internet tidal wave email and said, Microsoft, we miss this technology, and the future of computing is in the internet. And when Microsoft in 1995 said the future of computing is in this technology, uh, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. They were the dominant computing company in the world. They maybe are again. Um, and finally, it was the year that Netscape had their IPO. And this really got the hype going. They were valued at over a billion dollars without a nickel in profit. And the hype kept building, 96, 97, 98. And people stopped talking about the internet as if it was a new economy, or sorry, new technology. They started talking about it as if it's a new economy. Right? Now, there was a group of people who said, the internet is not a new economy. It's the same old economy. We still need our economics textbooks. And that was, of course, us, the economists. Because we wrote those textbooks, and we didn't want people to throw them out. In fact, the primary person behind this idea that, no, 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 we don't need to throw out our economics textbooks. We just need to understand what's changed, was the dominant textbook writer of the 1980s named Hal Varian. And what Hal Varian said with Carl Shapiro in a 1998 book was, we don't need to you know, this is not a new economy. What's changed is that search has gotten cheaper, communication's gotten cheaper, and copying, replication, has gotten cheaper. Once you understand those three things, then you can map out all the consequences of the internet over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And if you look back at that book, it's surprisingly prescient. Talked about cheap search, talked about cheap communication, but cheap replication, some of those were not so surprising. He said, well, you know what? Copyright's going to be a much bigger deal than we thought before. Because once you can copy anything, then we're going to be paying attention to the law in a different way. But what they also emphasized that was maybe less obvious was that privacy was going to be a much bigger deal than it was before. Because once anything you say to anyone could be instantly replicated to everyone everywhere, then we're going to be a little more careful about what we say. And we're going to care a little more about the consequences. Once you understand what's cheap, then you can map out all sorts of consequences about what's going to happen. To get your head around this a little bit more, let's jump back another generation and think about your computer. Think about the semiconductor. What does your computer really do? It feels like your computer does all sorts of things, right? But if you think deeply, it really only does one thing. Your computer, and as economists, we like to think this is a drop in the cost of something, you can think about your computer as a drop in the cost of arithmetic. That's what your computer does. It feels like your computer does all sorts of things, but it doesn't. It just adds. That's it. But it turns out, when arithmetic is cheap enough, we find all sorts of applications for arithmetic 
that we might not have dreamed of before. So the first, what happened? Let's map this out. The first applications of machine arithmetic were good old-fashioned arithmetic problems. In fact, you know, one of the first applications were we effectively had cannons and they shot cannonballs. And it's a really difficult arithmetic problem to figure out where those cannonballs are going to land. And so we had teams of humans whose job was called computer who figured out the trajectory of those cannonballs. The movie Hidden Figures was about these humans, these human computers, who figured out the trajectory of those cannonballs. But then machine arithmetic was better, faster, cheaper, and replaced the humans. Then it became even cheaper, and we found another set of applications where humans had been doing arithmetic, but we started replacing those humans with machines, accounting. If you ask an accountant from 50, 60, 70 years ago what they spend their lives doing, they spent their time adding. They added up columns of numbers. My colleagues in the accounting department at our business school remember a homework problem that their professors gave to them, which was to open up the white pages, open up the phone book, to say page number 962 and add up the phone numbers. Why? Partly because professors are like that. <laughs> but the students put up with it. Why did the students put up with it? The students put up with it because they knew that's what they would be spending their lives doing. But then machine arithmetic got cheap and we started replacing the humans with machines. This is going to come back again when we think about the hope with machine prediction, which is that there's still plenty of accountants around because it turned out the people who were best at arithmetic were also best positioned to leverage that arithmetic for corporate strategy and for tax policy. But then arithmetic got even cheaper and we found all sorts of applications for arithmetic that we never used to think of as arithmetic problems. Turns out games can be thought of as arithmetic. Mail is arithmetic. Music is arithmetic, and pictures are arithmetic. We used to think of pictures as a chemical problem. Kodak was a chemical company. But as machine arithmetic got cheap, we got to reframe these old-fashioned problems these, as arithmetic problems. Now, it's true, just as an aside, Ada Lovelace figured this out like 200 years ago. But for the rest of us, and more generally, it wasn't practical until machine arithmetic became cheap. That gets us to today. This is a representation of a convolutional neural net. This is one of the technologies underlying the current excitement in AI. We should think about this change as a drop in the cost of prediction. What's going to happen? Just like with machine arithmetic, better, faster, cheaper prediction is going to mean we use prediction in more places. That's why this is the simple economics of AI. Okay. Who here has taken an economics class at some point in your lives? Out of curiosity. Okay. So for those of you who haven't, the very first day you learn something called about the demand curve. And demand curve slope downward. What does that mean? It means when something becomes cheap, we buy more of it. If coffee is cheap, the price of coffee goes down, people buy more coffee. That's all we're talking about here. When the price of prediction gets cheap, when prediction is cheap, we're going to do more and more and more prediction. So the first applications of machine prediction are going to be good old-fashioned prediction problems, just like with arithmetic. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, well, uh, you walk into a bank and you want a loan. And the loan officer at the bank has to predict where they're going to pay back that loan. They used to look you up and down and decide make a prediction about whether you're going to pay back. Then we move to credit scores. And now increasingly we're using AI, we're using machine learning to predict whether people are going to pay back. The insurance industry is in the business of prediction. That is what they do. And so increasingly they're using machine learning in their predictions instead of whatever tools they've been using before. But as prediction's getting cheap, we're also recognizing a whole bunch of new applications for prediction. It turns out diagnosis is prediction. What does your doctor do when they diagnose you with a particular problem? They take in data about your symptoms and they fill in the missing information of the cause of those symptoms. That's prediction. It turns out image recognition is prediction. How does that work? 
Well, when you recognize a familiar face, your eyes essentially take in light signals and fill in the missing information of a label and a context. And driving can be thought of as prediction. In fact, maybe more than any other advance, the current excitement around autonomous vehicles is based on a simple insight, which is that we don't need to tell the machine what to do. All we need to do is tell the machine to observe millions and millions of miles of human driving and predict what a good human driver would do. Cheap prediction has reframed the set of problems that we think of as prediction problems. Okay, so the first thing we said is when coffee gets cheap, we buy more coffee. That's not good if you're in the tea business, right? Tea and coffee are substitutes. So what happens when machine prediction gets cheap? The aspects of your job that are prediction are going to go away. Machine prediction and human prediction are substitutes. That's you know, not necessarily a problem because something else happens when coffee gets cheap, which is that we buy more cream and sugar. Cream and sugar are the complements to coffee. And so the big question in understanding the economic implications of AI, this generation of AI, is what are the complements? What becomes more valuable as prediction gets cheap? In order to understand that, you need to know why prediction is useful. A prediction is useful because it helps you make better decisions. A prediction in and of itself has no value. It is only useful because it helps you make decisions. And decisions are a big deal. Make decisions all the time. You make big decisions. What job should I take? When should I retire? Should I go back to school? And you make small decisions. Should I write that down? Should I scratch my face? These decisions happen all the time. Because decisions are everywhere, and because prediction is part of decision making, that's why better, faster, cheaper prediction is a big deal. That's why this technology is worth paying attention to. But the hope lies in the recognition that there's other parts of decision making. Everything that we do, all of our intelligence, all of our actions are not simply predictions. There's more to it than that. And so I've sort of summarized 70 years of decision theory into this, this little graph here, uh, this little visual. But we, we have prediction at the center because that's what's changed. There's different kinds of data. You need those to make better predictions. There's a prediction is useful, useless unless you can do something with it. And there's this thing we call judgment. Oh, okay. Judgment, I think, is the maybe the most interesting and the one that people don't always think through. So the best example of judgment from pop culture, at least that I can think of, that we came up with is from this movie, iRobot. Anyone seen the movie, iRobot? A few of you. It's, it's a fine movie. Um, but it's a fine movie with a great scene. Okay, so Will Smith is the protagonist in iRobot. And he hates robots. So you can kind of see where the movie's going. And there's a scene that describes why he hates robots. And in particular, he and this little girl are driving. And for whatever reason, they get into an accident. And both cars are sinking into a river. And it's pretty clear that both Will Smith and this little girl are about to drown. Then a robot comes along and saves him and not her. And that's why he hates robots. Thinks the robot should have saved the girl and not him. Now, what's interesting is, in the context of a machine, he can then audit the decision. He can figure out why the machine saved him and not the girl. And he learns that the robot predicted that he had a 45% chance of survival, and that girl only had an 11% chance. And so the robot saved him and not the girl. And he says, well, you know what? 11% was more than enough, and a human being would have known that. Now he's saying something very particular. He's saying that that girl's life is worth more than four times his life. If he had a 45% chance of survival and that girl had an 11% chance, he is saying something very specific about how we value his life relative to that girl's. That's what we call judgment. It's the reward to an action. It's the payoffs at the end of a decision tree. That is still human. We can't use the a prediction in and of itself doesn't help us make the decision. We also have to decide what we care about. And that remains uh, 
human domain and using prediction machines well, using AI well, means that you need to think deeply and work hard at this judgment set. The vast majority of the time when we see AIs in practice, we can think about them as tools for tasks. So the vast majority of the time when we look at our startups that have come through the lab, they're building tools that help companies become, other companies become incrementally more productive. When we see AIs used in organizations like banks or elsewhere, these are tools that help uh, those banks become incrementally more productive. They don't change uh, the way the industry operates in any deep way, but they are productive and they make things better. You think about what's happening at the big companies, Amazon, Google, the, the ones we might think of as the forefront of AI. Again, for the most part, AI is a tool for a task. And if you're thinking about using it in, in your own organization or thinking about teaching it to other people in our book, we sort of walk through how do you figure out how to build a tool? How do you communicate? How do you translate between the tech people and the, um, and the business people? Every once in a while though, an AI is more than a tool for a task. Every once in a while, it can change the way an industry is structured. So 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, I should say 30 years ago, 30 years ago, um, if you went to the library and you said, what do you think the most exciting industry is going to be 30 years from now in the entire world? Or one of the most exciting companies is going to be in the entire world? I bet you none of the librarians would have said library science is the future. But it turns out when search became cheap, that led to all sorts of commercial applications for search that we never dreamed of before. When you look stuff up, we used to have to subsidize that. It was, we viewed it as sufficiently valuable to society, but people weren't willing to pay for it. There was no market for it, that we had these institutions called libraries that were there to help us look stuff up. And don't get me wrong, libraries are still here. But it turns out there are all sorts of commercial opportunities in looking stuff up that we never thought of before. Cheap search led to a whole new industry largely based on library science. So how do we think about AI? How do we think about cheap prediction? Well, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. This is still very early, but we can think through a process to get us there. So maybe this is showing our age, but we like to think of an old fashioned volume dial. But instead of turning up the volume on sound, you're turning up the prediction. So your prediction is getting better and better and better and better. And as the prediction gets better, at some point you'll be able to operate differently. For example, came here, it was early for my flight, so I went to the airport lounge, okay? Uh, why does the airport lounge exist? The airport lounge exists because the airline doesn't know how long it's gonna take me to get to the airport and through security. With a better prediction of how long it's gonna take from me to get from my house to the airplane door, there is no need for them to have a lounge for their better customers. That's actually bad service, right? The ideal would be you get to the airport and you walk in the plane. That's what good service in the airline industry would look like. That doesn't happen. Instead, because they have bad predictions, because they don't know how long it's gonna take and because I don't know how long it's gonna take, they've developed this kludge, this imperfect tool to allow me to, while I'm sitting and waiting for my flight, to have a slightly more comfortable time. Better prediction means we don't need an airport lounge. Right? Maybe a, a bigger deal, a bigger industry is to think about retail. Amazon makes these predictions all the time. They have AIs, they have a recommendation engine, and that recommendation engine suggests to all of us, at least all of us who use Amazon, what we're gonna buy. And the recommendation engine's pretty good in the sense that they have hundreds of millions of items in their catalog, and we find they're right about 5% of the time. They won't, they won't give us a number, but I gave this talk at Amazon and I started at 1% and they're like, and then I went to 50% and, things, and then I said 5% and no one argued. So, um, so we're gonna go with 5%, um, but roughly one out of every 20 items that they recommend you buy. That's amazing, right? With hundreds of millions of items in the catalog, but it's not really transformative. Amazon's in the same business they were in 1995 
And in fact, they're in the same business that the Sears catalog was in well over 100 years ago. Amazon remains a catalog company. They're a really good catalog company. They do it much better than Sears did, but they're a catalog company. They have an online catalog. You go, you look at the catalog, you choose what you want. They send that information to their warehouse. Someone at the warehouse packs it in a box and they ship it to your door. Now, let's think through if instead of 5%, they were 15% accurate or 20 or 30 or 50 or 70. At some point, their predictions are going to be good enough that they won't wait. Why wait for you to tell them what you want? Right? Why not just ship it to your door? They don't have to be 100% right. It just has to be, they have to get enough more of your purchases so that it's worth it for them to build an infrastructure for returns. So why, right now their model is you shop and then they ship. If predictions are good enough, they can ship and then you shop at your door. And to be clear, like this is, this is science fiction. We don't know if this is going to happen, but they definitely have thought about it. This is their first patent in anticipatory shipping, and it's from 2013. They've been thinking about using AI to predict what you want before you know you want it for six years. So whatever industry you're in, this thought experiment is worth doing. Whether you're in HR, well, what does it mean to know that a candidate's going to be good before you have to go out and post? Or what does it mean to know you're going to need to hire somebody with some probability months before you actually get the green light for it? Or what is your, how do we think about the healthcare system? Well, if the machine's doing diagnosis, what's the point of the primary care doctor? You still might need surgeons and you might need technicians, but you need somebody who is essentially selected and trained for a decade based on their ability to predict? Probably not. Now, I don't know if there's any doctors in here. Doctors really don't like it when I say this. Um, but when they say, oh, we do all sorts of other things. I'm like, yes, you do do all sorts of other things. But you're not trained for all those other things. Wouldn't it be much better to have a psychologist or a social worker or somebody who really knows and is trained to deal with people's emotions as the person who's doing all those other things and counseling patients rather than somebody whose training was fundamentally about memory and prediction? I don't know. But the, the essence of this exercise is to think through as prediction gets better, that can transform an industry. What are the aspects of an industry that exist because of prediction? And once the prediction gets good enough, what compromises do you no longer have to make? Now, the last thing I want to talk about are society level implications. And um, so we, we wrote, my, have my props, we wrote this book and the last chapter of society, and we, we held off on that chapter, and we're like, well, we don't, as we were thinking through the book, we don't, we don't really know enough. It's too early, not enough economists have thought about this idea. Uh, we're gonna hold off and um, let's invest in learning. And so there's these, you know, people who don't really know much about the economics saying uh, AI is gonna be the end of the world, or that's irresponsible to think about AI being the end of the world. We don't really know. And so what we did is we recognized nobody knew. This was about three years ago. And we brought a whole bunch of economists together to think through the economic consequences of AI. So um, that led to this book where we um, asked a couple of dozen leading economists to speculate on how they thought AI would affect society. And so we had Joe Stiglitz talk about AI and inequality. We had Hal Varian talk about um, AI and market power. We had um, Daniel Kahneman talk about um, uh, behavioral economics and AI. We brought in, uh, it was a really fascinating couple of days and we learned a ton. And what the last little bit of this talk is gonna be is to summarize the high level policy things that we learned or society level things that we learn from you know, listening to all those other economists. So the first question, and the question that people tend to focus on in the context of AI, is this the end of jobs? Okay. And what 
the conclusion very strongly from that conference is, is it's just the wrong question. Okay. Before we get to whether it is or isn't the end of jobs, we need to recognize it's the wrong question. What is it? Why is it the wrong question? You guys seen the movie The Matrix? Okay. Many of you have, I imagine. I mean, it's sort of a classic AI movie. You're at an AI seminar. Uh, so the movie The Matrix, every human has a job, right? Every human, from the day they're born to the day they die, works. They are batteries. That is what we do. That is not considered a good future, right? Everybody has a job, but it's not really good. In contrast, we think of this as something we enjoy, right? This person isn't working. They're relaxing. One of the major victories of the 20th century was that we no longer had to start working as soon as we were physically capable of working and work till pretty much we died almost every day for hours and hours and hours. One of the big victories of the 20th century was the rise of leisure. The rise of you know, time not away from work. So the first thing to recognize is when we, you know, as economists, we think about, is this the end of jobs? We recognize that there's um, often a choice between leisure and work, and all else equal, we'll choose leisure. So if we become fabulously wealthy and we all get to do whatever we want, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. There's a, a philosophical question that we don't have much to say about on Will we find meaning in our lives without work? But, um, but fundamentally, wealth without work should be a good thing, not a bad thing. But so, okay, so I should also add, you know, the, uh, every new technological change has led to this anxiety about will we still have jobs? And, Historically, we keep getting jobs, okay? Um, Joel Mokir is an economic historian, and he uh, said at our conference, look, there's two pessimistic views of what machines are gonna do. There's pessimistic view number one, which is that machines are gonna be so productive at everything we do, they're gonna take all our jobs. Pessimistic view number two is that all the great inventions have been, this is Bob Gordon's, all the great inventions have already been invented, uh, AI might be all well and good, but it's not indoor plumbing. And so the future is pessimistic because we're not going to have the same progress that we've had in the 20th century. And Mokir points out both of these views, uh, it's impossible for both of these views to be right. We can't both have AIs being so productive that they're taking away all our jobs and not being a big deal. Those two things can't exist at the same time. But he says they can both be wrong. And he argues that in this case, they are likely to be both be wrong. Because while AI will, um, if it fulfills its promise, it should increase productivity. Information technology seems to have already been a force for increasing productivity. Uh, that doesn't seem to be taking away all our jobs. So the big question then is not about jobs per se. The big question, the thing we need to think about is a trade-off between wealth and a potential trade-off between wealth and inequality. It's not, um, is AI going to take away our jobs? It's more, are those jobs going to be any good? And who's going to get them? Who's going to benefit from the wealth that's generated? And when we look at past generations of information technology, there's two reasons to worry that uh, AI will lead to increased inequality. The first one is what we call skill bias technical change. It's difficult to use technology in your job and every new generation makes it more and more difficult. So we are uh, likely to see people who are already skilled and are good, in particular people who are good at learning to benefit and people who are not good at learning to not benefit and that will increase inequality. That's um, Claudia Golden and, and Larry Katz, their, their emphasis. Uh, the other story is what um, is who own, gets to own the machines. Information technology often scales, and so this is a variant of uh, Thomas Piketty's um, uh, research, which is that, well, if the machines are owned by a small number of people, that will increase inequality. So that's a capital versus labor. So the first one is, Skilled labor versus unskilled labor, it's not about capital. And the second one is a story about capital versus labor. Okay. 
So big question number one is not, is this the end of jobs? Big question number one is how do we manage a potential trade-off between wealth and inequality? So remember this graph, data was at the center. All that gets us to think about privacy. All the res empirical research so far on uh, what happens when governments restrict privacy suggests that the companies that aren't able to use data don't use data, okay? That, that shouldn't be a surprise. The second step is they're using data for a reason. Data is useful for innovation. And so we should recognize a trade-off between privacy and innovation. That doesn't mean, to be clear, I want to be really clear, that does not mean any individual company should not be very careful about privacy. There's lots of reasons at the company level that it's optimal to be um, excessively, you know, extremely cautious with uh, consumer data. But when we get to the regulatory side, when governments regulate what can happen with data, it reduces innovation. There is a trade-off. Um, I don't have the expertise or the stake to figure out or, uh, what the right trade-off is, but I do have the expertise to measure and say that trade-off exists. Another big economic question is, are a few companies gonna dominate? Is this a scalable technology such that Amazon, Google, and others are going to uh, rule an AI like they have with the internet? Um, first thing to note is a lot of what we hear is this idea that there's economies of scale and data. So Google has all this data and that makes them better at AI and no one can catch up. That is a technically false point. What do I mean by that? If you have some basic statistics, you know that predictions improve in the square root of n. There's decreasing returns to scale and data. So think about if you've gone to the airport once, you've learned a lot about how long it takes to get to the airport. If you've gone to the airport a million times, the million and first time doesn't tell you much. Predictions improve. And so data has decreasing returns. Every additional observation is less useful than the previous one. What does that mean? It means there's not increasing returns to scale and data. There's not a direct data-related reason, like a technical reason, why large companies will dominate here. So in order to create economies of scale and data, we need to work. We can do that, but we, now we have to come up with a different story. We have to come up with a story that data is useless until some point, and there's a step function change, which means there's a minimum efficient scale above which data becomes useful. Um, or we can say that um, the competition isn't about being how good your predictions are, it's about being incrementally better than your competitor. Google used to be just a little bit better than Bing, but the argument that the people who worked for Bing went with is by being a little bit better, they got all the data. And that made it impossible for Bing to catch up. So Bing today is still much better than Google was five years ago. But, every, but Google still has a dominant share because they've been able to leverage you know, uh, incrementally better and better and better data. But I think the most likely scenario is something different which is economies of scope and talent, which in the context of AI, the biggest companies are hiring the most talented people and they're paying them a lot more than anyone else is willing to. And so what we see is a small number of companies not you know, hiring the best people out of universities. And then those people, we used to you know, hang out at universities because that's where the smart people were. But you know, if you're on the cutting edge of machine learning, maybe you want to go work for Google because that's where a lot of the cutting edge machine learning people are. And so this economies of scope and talent is leading to a small number of companies to dominate. With um, the last big question, uh, of course, is, is this the end of the world? And uh, it's not if we're focusing, you know, if we, once we recognize that the reason we're talking about AI today is prediction technology, it's machine learning, this is not a machine, this is not you know, uh, Life 3.0, this is not Max Tegmark's machine that's gonna take over the world. This is prediction technology. Prediction's a big deal, and we should think about inequality consequences, we should think about the consequences for market power, uh, but this isn't, um, this isn't machines taking over. We're not about to be in the Terminator world yet. 
Uh, but you know, you never know. Once if we think AGI is 20 to 50 years away, that's not that far. And so we need people to be thinking deeply about those general consequences. I want to conclude with what Daniel Kahneman said at our conference. So he listened to the conference and he, he summarized it with, the, with a story. He said, novelist wrote to me some time ago and he was going to write a, a, a novel about a love story between uh, two humans and a, and a robot. And the novelist asked uh, Professor Kahneman, what's different about the robot? And he responded with three things. He said, the robot uh, will be, um, so he said the robot's going to be better at understanding like math. Okay, that's not going to be a surprise to anyone here. You know, if I was telling this story to a robot, I wouldn't have had to start with a story. I could have just gone right to the conclusion. Okay. Then he said the robot's going to be uh, more emotionally intelligent because robots won't get angry. Robots won't get frustrated. In our old age, we're going to want to be taken care of by robots and not humans. We'd like our family to check in on us and tell them they love us, but we don't want our family to nag us about taking our pills. We'd rather, I'd much rather have a robot do that. And finally, he said the robot would be wiser because the robot would get the benefit of the um, experience of every other robot, and wisdom is bread. And so he concludes... I don't think there's very much that we can do that computers won't eventually learn to do. And so while today we think about the economic consequences, we're talking about prediction machines, you know, anything can happen in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Avi. There are so many things I would like to, to, to ask to you, but I will uh, wait. But I cannot resist to pick up at least on one thing you said. You, I think you started your talk by saying that um, we have uh, accepted that the machines are better than us in some respects. And I saw today in the news that Lee Sedol, who is uh, well, uh, one of the world top champion at Go, decided to resign, in fact, following his, his, uh, his last against the AlphaGo program because he's claiming that the, the, the technology has just gotten so 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 uh, so good at go that there's no point anymore. So Lisa Dahl resigned. So I think that's a nice illustration of some of the thing you mentioned. Okay, so we'll have uh, now uh, a few uh, discussion points raised by uh, Peter Deitch, who is a professor of uh, philosophy and ethics, the philosophy and ethics of economy at the University of Montreal. His main research topics are questions such as uh, uh, tax competition, uh, monetary policies, uh, central banking. Uh, he is also uh, the author of a book, Catching Capital, The Ethics of Tax Competition, published at Oxford University Press in 2015, and with François Claveau and Clément Fontaine, the author of another book published in 2018, Do Central Banks Serve uh, the People? It's in paperback at Polity Press. So, Peter, if you have a few uh, points you want to... Merci, uh, Dominique, uh, uh, and thank you, Avi, for your uh, engaging talk. So I stand between uh, the talk and you being able to ask questions, so I'll be uh, relatively brief, but I just want to throw out a few, uh, few um, reactions and, and questions uh, to, the, to the discussion. So the first is not actually a point about ethics, it's more a question about epistemology. Right? So I like your, your way of presenting AI, at least when we talk about machine learning, as, as a, a technology that leads to a, cost, uh, to a drop in the cost of prediction. Um, but I think as you also pointed out, uh, we are not quite sure yet to what exactly happens in this black box of prediction. So this is not based on an algorithm. So machine learning does not work as the Will Smith case where the robot says, okay, you have an 11% chance to survive, you have a 45% chance to survive. But it's the machine observing millions and millions of human actions and then basically extrapolating or, or using those actions to predict future, future events. Um, and so this reminded me of, of a methodological debate in economics in the 50s where people like Milton Friedman uh, were instrumentalist about economic modeling, right? They say, well, you know, if it works, I don't, I don't look under the hood of the car as long as it runs, right? 
Um, and so this has certain advantages because you can, you, know, you, can, you can work with it. But when there are structural breaks, when your car breaks down, you're in trouble. Right? So it's the same with AI as a prediction tool. When you don't understand the, the causality behind the prediction tool, uh, when there's a structural break, you don't really know what to do anymore. Right? Um, so I guess this, this uh, goes well with your observation about uh, we don't just need prediction, but we need judgment uh, to complement the prediction. Um, and so I wonder whether a lot more about our judgment will be about trying to figure out when the, predic the particular prediction that a machine has learned might break down and what implications that has for economics. Anyway, so that's, that's, the, that's the first point. Uh, the second is um, more about uh, an ethical question, and uh, um, those of you who know me will not be surprised that I ask about this, is the, the link to inequality. Right? Um, so, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, again, I, you know, I, like, I like your kind of deflationary statement about what, what's going on when, when you say, hang on, we, don't, we shouldn't throw out our microeconomics textbooks. Right? Uh, all that AI at this stage, in a way, is, is a very acute form of accumulated labor. Right? So when we just had capital as in machines and machines and labor, right? you could say, well, capital is accumula accumulated labor, and now this accumulated labor interacts with the unaccumulated labor to produce something. Right? So uh, the AI or these prediction tools are, in a way, a very concentrated form of, of, uh, of capital. Right? Um, so as you pointed out, this most likely will lead to certain inequalities because there's, there's a skill premium uh, uh, that is involved and there's also the big question of who owns the machines. Um, now here, uh, I'm, I, I will talk about, maybe bring in something that I read in, in one of your papers. So you said there, you know, in the discussion, there's two things that we could do to respond <coughs> to this inequality that arises. Uh, one is we could tax capital, right? Uh, so for instance, you know, some of the things that Piketty uh, uh, recommends go, go down that, uh, that road. Another one would be to introduce a universal basic income. Right? So here, here's two reactions that we might have faced with this inequality. But both of these are redistributive me measures. Right? And so I'm wondering whether we're not getting to the point where what we really need is what some people call pre-distributive measures. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I, what I mean by that. We've gotten to a point where um, it seems to me much harder to say that the person who owns these prediction technologies um, should have a right to the income flows that result from these prediction, prediction technologies. Right? So when, when, when if we just look at, at workers, I think there's a, there's a very strong intuition that you know, people say someone works in the field, right? And they, Plant, plant something, then they harvest it, and of course, you know, nature intervenes, but they've worked hard to, to produce this, right? Um, already in the kind of first stages of capitalism, you could say, well, you know, they've, they've accumulated the, the financial capital, so then they can buy the machines and so on. Um, but I think once we're getting to the point where if the data is relatively cheap, you can acquire the data, but then have huge income flows coming out of the other end, it's not clear to me to what extent the people who own the prediction technology shouldn't necessarily be assigned the right to the income flow that comes from it. So that's what I mean by a, by a pre-distributive measure that societies might take and that would not create the impression that we're just you know, dragging some people along with the universal basic income, but we're, we're uh, going a step further and taking a more radical um, distributive step. One, um, one last point about, uh, about privacy policy. So um, having worked on this tax competition stuff, I'm, I'm you know, uh, alert to races to the bottom, and, and you said in private privacy policy there might also be a race to the bottom, right? There's a there's a trade-off between uh, regulation on privacy and innovation, right? And therefore there's an incentive for countries to tread lightly when it comes to regulating privacy, um, uh, and therefore they might be reluctant to do so. So in the paper you mentioned uh, the European case, so the EU. Um, has regulated around the use of online tracking technologies. Um, and this uh, has reduced effectiveness of advertising in the European Union. For now, they stand by this choice and they, can't, they can afford to stand by this choice. Developing countries might not be able to afford this kind of step, first, first consideration. Um, 
And secondly, I think independently of where we come down in terms of this trade-off between regulation and uh, regulating privacy and innovation, um, I wonder whether you think uh, that calls for a global regulatory framework in this context are A, justified, right? So uh, we see this in other areas. We, we see calls such uh, for uh, minimum environmental standards, minimum labor standards. You could think of minimum privacy standards, right? So A, is there a case to be made for this? Uh, and B, what are, the, what are the chances it would succeed? Now this is, you know, I know you're a microeconomist and this is more a kind of international political economy question, but still I wanna probe your intuitions of um, what the chances might be. Thanks again for a wonderful talk. All right, so we have, I think, a good uh, 40 minutes for, uh, for questions. So if people have uh, questions in the audience, there's a microphone there. So just stand up and come to the mic and, and, and ask what you want to ask okay, about so just this very interesting talk and, and the points also that uh, were raised by uh, Peter Deitch. Thank okay, you. so just, yes. but I'd like to just have a, a quick response to what Peter said. Oh, yeah, said. I'm sorry. Yeah, I forgot. Okay. I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, you're right. Um, Go ahead. Sorry I about that. I agree with it um, overwhelmingly. So, first, um, I came to thinking about AI from a causal inference point of view, which is that, like, my career up until 2015 was as a statistician focused on what's causing what. And in fact, I taught an MBA course that. Uh, for years I developed and taught an MBA course, sort of statistical philosophy MBA course on why prediction technology, like prediction is just not useful. And we should always focus on what's causing what, that's how you make better decisions. Um, and, uh, and then when we saw the opportunities that were happening in machine learning, I realized, well, you know what? It turns out prediction is useful as long as you understand that it's an input into the overall decision. And so I fully agree causality is an issue. Um, and I, you know, to get to a truly intelligent machine, we need we need to think through causality. And you know, Jay Pearl won his his Turing Award for thinking through uh, what machines can do and causal. Okay. Second, on linked inequality, um, I've never heard the expression predistributive measures. Um, I've I've heard of some of the ones you suggested, but I haven't heard that. And I think um, in the context of AI, there's a you know two. Um, uh, two things I want to say. The first, OpenAI and a handful of other organizations are explicitly trying to say AI should not be in the domain of a small number of companies. It should be developed and then the tech should be, you know, the, the algorithm should be published. And in some sense, that's already happening at scale. So we think about um, you know, these, to, to the extent we, we believe our Canadian story, the um, these things were invented at the University of Toronto, the University of Montreal, and to some extent the University of Alberta, okay? But a lot of the wealth that's been generated on AI um, seems to have been generated in places outside Toronto and Montreal. And that's already a sense that this is a technology with strong spillover, like that um, that's widely diffused. The IP is not that strong. And so there's just an overall question of intellectual property um, how we think about patents versus papers that's underlying you know, economics technology generally, but in this context in particular. So I, I, I think that's a first order point. I think open AI is trying to get there. But um, then this is gonna jump into your race to the bottom point. So Dan Treffler and I wrote a paper on AI and international trade. And Dan Treffler is a trade economist. I was the one who knew about AI. And in, in writing this paper, I learned, well, so in trade 101, or maybe you know, grad school level, trade 101, you know, trade you know, 1201, um, you learn that it's really hard for economic policy to work. Like nationalist economic policy generally fails. Okay? And the reason is, is because rents, for it to be worth it for a government to invest in AI in order to help that country relative to others, uh, the the benefits of technology have to be highly localized. They can't spill over. And already the data from AI is saying that didn't happen. And so from a national, you know, from an open science point of view and making the whole world wealthier, then maybe there's a benefit to the government. You know, there is clearly a benefit to government investments in this, but from a, oh, it's gonna help Canada at the expense of some other country, not so much. Um, 
except in one area, and I think this is where this race to the bottom issue becomes really important. So AI is a technology that has an uh, economic consequences, and those are what I tend to think about. And um, when I, you know, um, you know our, our paper on AI and trade was uh, referenced to the WTO, it became a, a core part of their document for 2018. I guess the t for 2019 and thinking through how should AI make it into the WTO and the pushback that they've gotten and now we've gotten is, well, AI isn't just an economic technology, it's also a national security technology. And because of that, the race to the bottom becomes much more complicated. So it's hard to say, you know, the United States and China so far are not willing to tie their hands on what they're gonna do with the technology on the commercial side because they think the commercial has, milit well, among other reasons, there's, there's non-commercial benefits to the commercial technology. Okay. Um, one last point on the race to the bottom related to spillovers that I think is very useful. So uh, European privacy regulation has meant that data-driven innovation in commercial innovation in Europe has, especially in the advertising sector, has lagged elsewhere. That does not mean Europe isn't innovating. What can happen is that Europe just then innovates in other ways. And the, the best example of this is an historical paper. So Petra Moser, who's an economist at NYU, an economic historian, has this paper on patents. Switzerland didn't have patents um, in the 19th century or much of the 19th century. But Switzerland was incredibly innovative. What they did is they figured out that they put their scientists or their scientists endogenously went to industries that patent protection didn't matter. They went to industries that were all about trade secrets, whether it was you know, clocks most famously or chocolates less famously. Uh, you go to industry where patent protection doesn't matter, but innovation still matters. And so Europe uh, remains innovative and their innovators are likely moving to those sectors so far where the privacy regulation hasn't mattered. Uh, with that, I think we can open up to other questions. Unless you want to rebut. <laughs>